It's January 25th, 2024. Hi there. Welcome to episode 307 of Rook. And to those pundits who are speculating, yes, Iran is at war against its own people. I'm Gian Gameshi. Hello to you from Toronto. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durud Bashama. Most conflicts are fought against an external enemy. The Islamic Republic regime is at war against the Iranian people. There's been a lot of talk about the spate of horrific battles taking place around the world as we've entered into 2024, the Middle East, Yemen, Ukraine, and much more. And there's been media speculation about whether the Islamic Republic of Iran will enter these conflicts, as if bankrolling the likes of Hamas and Hezbollah is to be considered sitting on the sidelines. Well, let's be clear and call it as it is. Yes, Iran is at war against its own people. You see, even if the situation in Iran has faded from that meager Western media coverage after the killing of Massa Amini, don't believe that things have gotten better or that there are fewer atrocities to see. If you are a non-Iranian and you haven't been following the latest events and you'd even consider resuscitating that nuclear deal, take it from those of us with family still in the country and heed these words. The Islamic Republic of Iran is at war against the Iranian people. What else can you call it when a citizen of the country, a 23-year-old man with a mental health condition named Mohammad Qobadlu, is hung to death for protesting against the regime? What can you conclude about such a violation of international law except things are exactly as bad as they seem? Here's a fun fact. The Islamic Republic is the leading per capita executioner in the world. What else can you call it but war? When the regime is not using bullets in the streets to suppress the Iranian people, it's using a corrupt and unaccountable judicial system and sham trials to detain, torture, and execute. What else can you call the imprisonment of thousands for expressing their rights to free speech or assembly in a country that has set the standard for a lack of democracy at the hands of a group of mullahs for almost 45 years? Yes, Iran is at war against its own people. It would be sad if it weren't so infuriating. And if it's not new draconian so-called morality laws imposed on women, it's mismanagement and corruption that has led to water bankruptcy. It's an economy with a majority of the population in poverty. It's a country where air pollution has been left unchecked, so much so that 1,000 children under the age of five die each year due to air quality. Look, Iran is a majestic place with a rich culture that has been a bastion of invention and progress and poetry, romance and innovation through most of human history, but most of that is on hold at present. Right now it's a country whose citizens are captive to the whims of Ayatollahs, a population that is at war with its own messianic so-called government. Yes, the Islamic Republic is at war against the Iranian people. And those of us outside of Iran have to keep the attention on these war crimes. We have to keep pointing to the atrocities committed by this regime no matter how many times. But it is the courageous people inside Iran who are leading the way. And so it is that 61 female political prisoners in the notoriously brutal Evin prison went on a hunger strike today to demand the cessation of executions. So it is that Iranian dissident artists have joined that hunger strike. So it is that prominent Iranian activists and public figures around the world are joining the strike now too. Yeah, Iran is at war against its own people. But here's a sure bet that over time, the Ayatollahs prosecuting the war will eventually lose. The people will keep rising. The option of staying silent or staying vigilant is yours to choose. Coming up, a new edition of Rook with a roundtable to discuss this week's events from a diaspora perspective with Pega and Raha. But first, a feature interview with the remarkably talented dancer and choreographer Navid Rezvani joining us from Oslo, Norway. This is Rook, episode 307. Yes, the Islamic Republic is at war. It's at war with the Iranian people. Here we are in the Rook studio. Uh, good to have you join us wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Salam. Hello. I'm Gian and Pega's here. Smart Pega. Hello. Raha is here. 
Hi. Resident Raha. Nice Everyone's to have you. Everyone's healthy. Well, nice to have you both back at <laughs> once. You. It's yeah. remarkable. A remarkable feat. Um, Navid Rezvani mm-hmm. joining us in, in a little bit. Uh, he is... He, he did, had you seen Navi's work? I, I mean, had. You, you watch Persia's Got Talent. I did. So you know that he won Persia's Got Talent That's about right. three years ago. Uh, and he is, I mean, he's kind of a, a freak of nature in terms of what he can do with mm-hmm. his body. He, he break dances, he's hip hop dancing, um, but he's incredibly athletic. You know, uh, I was reading in the research, I'm going to ask him about this but one of his when he was a little kid one of his inspirations was spider-man oh. and he sort of likes spider-man <laughs> like he's jumping around you know he yeah. hangs upside down he yeah. does uh he's just so talented um so such an interesting story that he ends up in norway mm-hmm. he's joining us from there and i have to say he posted on instagram two or three days ago um <clears throat> it, it, was, it was something like he little made a little video and he said you know, a lot of people talk about what a real Iranian is. He was speaking in Persian. Mm-hmm. A lot of people talk about what a real Iranian is, somebody inside Iran versus somebody outside Iran. Um, I know that I think a real Iranian is somebody who opposes executions. Wow. Uh, and that was, I thought, a very eloquent way of making yeah. his point about, uh, he's he's been very outspoken about uh, about Iran and the regime, and which is interesting because his father was involved in in the regime as a diplomat, oh. um, so it's a it's quite a story. But that that post resonated, and I'll ask him about mm-hmm. that at the top of the interview. And I'm so excited; he is so incredibly talented and seemingly so um, gracious and such a nice guy. Uh, mm-hmm. Looking forward to speaking with Navid Rezvani in Oslo coming up uh, in just a few moments. Um, Normally, it's funny, we had prepared this, uh, we were talking last week about what we were going to do on our roundtable this week, and then, of course, events take over, and there was this execution this week, which was a little bit more by surprise than some of the the, some of the executions that have happened we've Mm -hmm. heard about them coming for quite some time this one there was about 24 hours notice and Mm -hmm. um you know much of the iranian diaspora and folks inside iran galvanized and were trying to be loud enough to prevent Mm -hmm. things from happening and then the regime went ahead with it um but because of that, and, and coming off this uh, little opening essay that I just did there, I thought we'd just start the show talking a little bit about what's going on and then get to Navid. And mm-hmm. uh, um, and partly as well because uh, we've all been talking just in the last couple of hours about how there's breaking news of a sort. I mean, by the time people hear this podcast, this might be um, – really breaking news in terms of it might have gone in all kinds of different directions. But as I mentioned in that opening essay, a bunch of people who are in prison in Iran, led by women, Mm -hmm. women and men, have started a hunger strike, Mm -hmm. um, both to protest the execution of Mohammad, uh, but also uh, just to to call for the stoppage of executions in general. And then that has led all kinds of people other people in Iran, mm-hmm. uh, including famously detained people like Tumaj, yeah. and activists around the world now to be in solidarity mm-hmm. saying that they're on a hunger strike. So yeah. what what is the, I mean, I've been here doing the essay, you, <laughs> you've been looking at what's going, what, what, is, what, what can you say about this right now? Yeah, I mean, I think you covered most of it. Um, we're definitely starting to see a campaign um, kind of resurface because if you recall, um, and I can't recall exactly how many months back, but within um, maybe six, seven months ago, there was uh, a campaign where a lot of activists, a lot of actors, actresses, um, you know, I- individuals who had a following of some sort were <coughs> were putting these um, signs up and taking photos of themselves with hashtag stop executions in Iran yeah. or stop executions or something along that line um, and trying to raise awareness about the executions in Iran. So we're actually seeing that resurface now mm-hmm. with um, the news of actually Nagis Mohammadi starting this um, this new campaign with the 61 activists uh, inside Evin who have started to go on hunger strike as of today. By the way, yeah. incredibly brave. Very You're brave. already in Evin. Right. That's right. Uh, and and you're leading the revolution. Uh, That's right. <coughs> yeah. 
And I mean, she's been vocal in, in saying that in, in the months that we've seen, even following um, the fact that she won the Nobel Peace Prize, saying that she wasn't going to stop. She wasn't going to, you know, kind of waver in front of what's happened with the Islamic Republic and, and them saying that they can't, she can't have visitation with her lawyer or anything like yeah. that. So very, very brave on her part. Um, you know, it, it's, it feels like an interesting moment because since, I guess, but certainly in the summer, last summer, mm -hmm. where really it felt like things had dissipated in terms of the uprising and all the energy. That This is one of the first times since last year, this time, where yeah. I felt like the, commu the global community is re-engaging. And something that I thought was really interesting just in the last 48 hours um, is that uh, even, you know, I mean, we often talk about perhaps optimistically that uh, each each uprising in Iran, each time there's, you know, the 1999 students, the Green Movement, um, uh, Aubon in, in, in 2019, and mm -hmm. then, you know, the, of course, the, the Women, Life, Freedom, that it gets bigger and that it builds yeah. on the last one and that there's, you know, closer to achieving some sort of major change in Iran, some sort of revolution, et cetera. But this is interesting to, to observe uh, a shift in the diaspora mm -hmm. too, where, where the muscle memory of what we did a year ago, a year and a half ago, still exists, right? You see everybody is, is kind of familiar with jumping back into action here, which, which, which is nice to see mm -hmm. that after, I mean, I don't know if that means that there's gonna be 80,000 people on the street in Toronto again, like there was at some point in November, 2022, but, but uh, it's good to see that that it's not that far off when people feel get you know there's cause to support the people inside Iran again. People are are, are exercising their mm -hmm. their opinions, are getting back online talking about it, and there's been some demonstrations, smaller ones, but they're here in Toronto and around the world, and so um, that's heartening. You know, uh, uh, that's one more check mark in the in the column that says the revolution hasn't died; it just goes through ups mm -hmm. and downs, and people are you know, um, still ready to get into action if it can mean change in Iran. I mean, I'm saying that as there are a lot of people saying, Boro Baba Diga, that's over, yeah. you know, like, and, and it's gonna be years before anybody can change this regime. And by the way, they just executed an innocent, or a, a protester. So, so you know, I'm, I'm perhaps pulling silver lining out of something. <laughs> but I do think it, it's, it's uh, heartening to observe that kind of, it is. Uh, uh, you know, collective action. I mean, I, I definitely think the solidarity is beautiful. And any time we've seen a show of solidarity, I've always felt that way. But I also worry, especially with the fact that we have seen kind of, you know, a dip in that activism and that coming together and all of these things over the last few months um, about the efficacy of this. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think it's great. I think bringing... Efficacy of what? Uh, of the hunger strikes. Of hunger strikes, yeah. I mean... You know, how many outside times outside of we, Iran, you mean, right? Outside, outside of, of Iran, prisons, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you mean people going on a hunger strike outside uh, of Iran yeah. in solidarity, Iran. I yeah. see. In yeah. solidarity yeah. with the individuals who yeah. have started this campaign. I mean, the reason I say that is because just hours after Mohammad Qobadlu was, exec was executed, we saw the um, Stefan Sojan, I believe, his, or Sojan, I think his name is, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, shaking hands with Amir Abdel Nahyan. The fact is that despite these campaigns and these things, we still have the West enabling the Islamic Republic. There's still no mm. further action taken by them. Yeah. We're still trying to advocate for putting the IRGC on the right, terrorist list. Right, but the campaign is only two or three days old. I and agree. The I'm, hunger strike started today. No, I'm so, saying yeah. this is a general right. kind of statement that, yeah. again, the solidarity is beautiful, but yeah. I think if we want to have... Now, the normalization of, of like Abdullah Hion is... is yeah beyond at this exactly. point. I mean, he's yeah. turning up at this guy's like, you know, he might as well be just going to the White House gala. I mean, he's like, you know, he's on all the international events. And that's he my problem. He was at the UN again <laughs> speaking, I guess, last week or something. Or yes, he was. In his interesting version of English. And yeah, I mean, uh, he's he was a, a guest of honor for God's sake. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was given a, a platform that so many other countries and so many other representatives aren't given. And yet, you know, what what needs to happen in Iran for yeah. the West to wake up? Yeah, it is. A, yeah. So you're saying you're not sure if, about the efficacy of people in solidarity going on a yeah. hunger strike yeah. if they're Basically in Fresno, fasting. California. Fasting at home yeah. is what they're that, doing. That's exactly right? it. And you don't, you're not impressed I mean, by that, Rahul? Um, 
I do I do agree with the solidarity and like the symbolism about uh, of it all but um, I like I like actions that that would put this more in, in spotlight and starting campaigns that would actually create a national international wave like um, for example I like um, I like what Hamid Esmailoun actually posted asking Neda Al Nashif who is the um, deputy high commissioner of, of uh, the United, the United Nations. Nations to go to Iran and visit the p- prisoners you know like things like that starting starting this this talk and starting talking about actions that can be taken in order to mm. maybe create um, some sort of a um, reaction from the outside world. I mean, for what it's <laughs> worth, uh, do you guys remember Vahid Beheshti? Mm-hmm. Of course. He was the hunger striker in London mm-hmm. uh, that got a lot of attention yes. and, and got critically weakened by his, uh, right. when he finally called it off, they took him to the hospital. And um, But his one demand, the whole hunger strike for three months or whatever was, to put the IRGC on the terrorist and, list, and in where Britain. did we get with that? Didn't it didn't he, happen? He ended up yeah. becoming ill. He became hospitalized. We were. No he brought closer. a lot of attention to he things. He brought attention you know, to but it. Yeah, yeah. And and I and see that's very different than from my understanding. This hunger strike is meant to last one day so far. So we haven't heard anything beyond that. So you know, in one day with people using their platform and things like that. Again, I'm for it. I think mm-hmm. any sort of awareness and education and things like that is great. But I think, again, looking back at the last few months and looking at this dip in activism and mm-hmm. coming together and the solidarity and all of these things, you know, I'm all for this being the spark that results in other things. Sure. But again, we should be focusing on other things that are happening as well, especially in my opinion, for those of us who are outside of Iran, when we have foreign ministers and things like that giving platforms to someone like Amir Abdul mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. other thing I wanted to add is, you know, Mohammed Qobad and what happened with him, this happening all of a sudden, is I think what really sparked this outrage because the reality is executions are happening in Iran every yeah. single day. Yeah. You know, on the same day not, that... Not always for protesting, though. Not, that's, not that, always that, for that's protesting. That's also why this is... A, yeah. you know. But political prisoners, yeah. all sorts of other reasons. On the same day that Mohammad Ghobadlu was executed, Farhad Salimi, who was a political prisoner for 14 years, was also executed. He, you know, really, really sad thing that I was actually reading about him is that his family had been advocating for him for the entire dur- duration that he had been in prison. And they kind of knew that an execution was looming. So their one last, I guess, ask was to see him. And so back and forth with, you know, all sorts of guards and mm-hmm. whatever the situation with the prison was. And so they finally said, okay, we'll come and see him only mm-hmm. for the family to show up. And he had already been executed. Yeah. I mean, this is a reality that so many families are dealing with mm-hmm. on the daily in Iran. Well, also a reality that, uh, I mean, if anybody's listening going, come on, don't paint such a bad picture of Iran. Mm-hmm. I mentioned the statistic in that in the my opening essay there. The execution capital per capita of the world yeah. is Iran. I mean, it, 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 the, the death penalty still exists in a number of places in the world. The worst place mm-hmm. for the use of it is Iran. That's, That's a right. stat. There's nothing we're gonna, you know, and and it is, um, a, and then it's all the more morbid and macabre that it is exercised for somebody being a protester. Uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 against all, international law, mm-hmm. and then there's the mental health element. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, and not only you know the going against international law and all of these but all of these things, but we've talked about this so many times. It's one thing for you to go to go through predi- proper judicial channels. Yeah. These are sham trials. We know that there's no right. value to any of this from from the base, from arresting these individuals, putting them through trial, imprisoning them, torturing them, and then finally executing them. All of it right. from step one is all. So how are we doing on the on the meter of? Stop th- focusing on the Gamgeen stuff and get oh. to try. It's <laughs> why, hard. Why are it's you so guys getting political to... again? Well, I mean, how are we doing with that? I mean, how can you not get political? I but know. I think one of the things I, I was mentioning to you guys before this as well is um, I noticed how many people are posting this, but then under like under their posts or under the their story writing, um, you know, it's so painful that we've all gotten used to this and that um, the this pain is kind of like an overworked muscle that doesn't properly work anymore. And I feel like that's, that's the case with all of us. We're like, Oh, 
That's so sad. Well, Another I, execution. Yeah. And then we're like, okay, but what, what can we do? We can't do anything and we have to move on with our lives. And that's the sad part of it. Like if it was any there's other no point, places in the world. There's no point in canceling Noru's. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, if it was in any other part of the world, this wouldn't be happening. But uh, unfortunately. And the outrage, I think, would be so much more because it yeah. wouldn't be a, an everyday occurrence. That's exactly. what it is. Exactly. And I think that's very sad that we're looking at the bigger picture and calling that and saying, oh, you know, we should pay attention to this because Iran is the execution capital of the world. Like, even one person matters, mm. right? If this was anywhere, if this was anywhere else in the world, mm. like France or Canada or, or U.S., if there was one execution being unfairly done, what, wouldn't it? No, wouldn't there was some, there were like some profound takeaways of the uprising that happened uh, that began with the killing of Masson Amini and, yeah. and reached its zenith in the first mm-hmm. few months after it. And one of the take- takeaways was we're totally alone. Yeah. No, That's you know, right. Iranians, people of Iranian descent around the world yeah. will not get any support from anybody. No, but Macron but saying, will yeah. meet with the Masih Ahmadinejad and Hamid Ismailian will walk with Trudeau and they'll all say, yeah, pat us on the head and everything and do nothing. Do yeah. nothing, right? Yeah. I mean, in Canada. In Canada, the IRGC is still not on the terrorist yeah. list. Yeah. In this fucking country where all of these uh, Iranian with ties to the regime have been found here, uh, I mean, there's no Except. excuse for it. Well, that's Zero. What I, that's what I was going to say. Is Not only has nothing been done. Not to mention Flight 752. Of course. We're also known as the safe haven for, yeah. for, for all, all of these, of these individuals. Yeah. I mean, so here, now let's talk about Sachi well, I, I was just going to say, you, you're asking us where we are on the Ramgin meter, and then you well, then follow I got, well, it with this. No, because I was... Can we actually get a Ramgin meter? We should, actually. It's like a little metronome or something. We've got an Arsenal bell and a Ramgin meter. Things we have in the Rook studio. We are at 90% on the Ramgin. Well, listen, uh, I'm looking forward to having Navid Rezvani because uh, we will talk about some serious stuff, but but he is such an inspiration Mm -hmm. in terms of what what he does. We'll come to him in in just a bit in Oslo. Did you have anything more to add? On the nothing okay. more for the yeah. Damgin meter. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and Rahul? No. No. Well, what we can add is that we are less than two weeks away from yes. our first Rook Live. We are doing Rook in front of an audience. If you're in the greater Toronto area, I don't even know if there's are there still tickets. I, I, I didn't check. Very this. few. Very, okay. very few. So there's <laughs> a few tickets left. You go to Eventbrite if you're in the greater Toronto area at Theatre Aurora. This is in scenic Aurora, Ontario, <laughs> Canada, where I failed my driver's license at least twice. Oh, wow. It's all a blur after that. It could have been many more times as well. Uh, oh, wow. Did you not fail it there? I didn't oh, fail it there. Said, I did it there, but I didn't fail it uh, there. <laughs> of course you didn't fail it. This will be, I can't wait to talk about this on stage at Aurora. Oh, my God. Uh, did so you win worried. some medals I'm there, too? I'm so worried too? about what you're going to talk about <laughs> on that stage there. <laughs> It'll be a good time. Where did I'm you sure get though. your driver's license? Aurora. <laughs> in one in one did you have to no 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 I failed twice all right thank you yeah. very much solidarity and, and, and not my, everyone is per- and my it's G2. like mean girls in here oh my god you're like Regina I was like we're mentioning we're, like I never failed but I think <laughs> you're the leader of meanness here first of all I didn't say <laughs> oh you you failed or I didn't fail I said oh I didn't know that you got it there you bring this on and upon then you yourself looked at me and look said, at what you're I doing failed. to Pega <laughs> poor Pega poor Pega, oh, no, Pega can, look I'm siding with you okay. next time uh, I've got yeah, your back. Yeah. How many? How many? Uh, well, how many times do you think I failed? I think I twice. Think I, no, I think I actually failed three times. Oh, yeah. I, it's I, so nerve wracking. I, I failed have to admit, it uh, the first time. Oh, it was the worst. I can't. I don't. Want, I'll tell the story another day. But yeah. it's because uh, actually I'll tell the story in Aurora. Okay. Because it's a very sad, pathetic story <laughs> of me with my little black boots and my little punk hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, How old were you? Can you I bring 16. a photo? Oh. I was 16 and I went up there and like I uh, like my uh, tight black jeans and my shirt tucked into the jeans and rolled up sleeves, you know, like uh, looking like, so think, cool. thinking I looked like uh, a member of the mm-hmm. Clash, <laughs> but really just looked like a, like a Persian kid with too much gel in his hair and, oh and with that big nose. And anyway, so I'm sitting and, uh, and, uh, the, the guy like well don't tell us well, I won't tell you but I will tell you this part I got okay. I get in the car and the instructor like uh, it's like the instructor looks at me right and goes oh <laughs> Oh, like, that's how it starts. Like he, like, it was doomed he, from the he beginning. He literally looks at me and just goes, oh, like, oh. <laughs> like, I'm like, hello, sir. I, you know, it was the worst. Wow. Was, uh, 
Rook live in Aurora. <laughs> like he was like, oh, like he like his day got worse. <laughs> he saw me. Like, what were my chances of not failing? I was gonna say it was zero from the beginning. Yeah. And then, oh, it was just yeah. <sighs> I still well, remember you, that. You so. now have your license, so. You still, <laughs> yeah, for now. <laughs> and, and I'm conquer. I'm coming back to conquer uh, Aurora, yes. the place conquered by fears yes. of being able to drive there. <laughs> it was, or, and how much, you know, I think my opening uh, about our live show at Theater Aurora will be about how much the world has changed in terms of Iranians. Mm -hmm. So part of the losing, failing the license in Aurora is that the, you know, in that at that time it was like a super homogenous white place small and and now aurora is like homogenous persian place. yeah that's that's a pretty exactly <laughs> homogeneously persian that's right. there's like persian nail salons there's and persian, you know cabobies and like it's like what yeah. happened it's How did more this... persian than tehran oh my god <laughs> actually i'm starting to think that aurora is more persian than north york which is a huge oh, shift because growing yeah. up it was like north york was the only place in toronto that was kind of persian Maziar Falahi, Shiva Nagar, mm. Banaf Shetahrian, performances by Bob Akamini, uh, lots of our friends. Captain Reza will be making an appearance. That's right. Uh, Theater Aurora, if you, if you check if the tickets are still available, go to Eventbrite uh, and uh, type in Rook or Rook Live, or just go to our Instagram and press the link on the bio. Um, also, so I'm looking forward to that. That's mm -hmm. February 7th, Rook Live. And also wanted to mention that uh, in March, Joining us here in the Rook studio for a special feature episode interview, the producer, the songwriter, the musician, the founder of Black Cats. Yes, Chapal Chaparre. Mm -hmm. I was joking last week, uh, although not really joking. Oh, here we so go. Don't call me mean for saying these. These here are facts. Here we go. Here we go. Pega probably couldn't sing back a Beatles song, but knows the back catalog of Black Cats. Is that no. true, Pega? Oh. That's right. she's, <laughs> she's proud of it. That, of course I am. I, I Where like are you on the Black Persian Cats music, meter? Okay? Do you have a lot of, uh, do you know the Black Cats back then? Yeah, like their old stuff, you oh. know, what, what I grew the up OG with. OG Black Cats. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was saying Comrade too. Comrade and before. Thank you. That's you know? not their old stuff though. Is it, it is. No, is she it? said Comrade and Human and, and before. before. And before. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, they go back to the... Oh, they go back. They go back to, to Ebi before the revolution. I think Ebi and Darius were the first Black Cats. Yes, I didn't know that. Well, and, uh, and you and call yourself and a I fan. call myself a this Chapal Chaparre. He he's incredible. a he's a he's amazing. Yeah, he's yeah. a wonder, and I'm thrilled to have him here. He'll be in Toronto as well as part of the Bidmeshk Noruz Gala. I want to give them a uh, a shout out because uh, they're helping us uh, uh, bring Chapal to our studio. This is an event I attended last year. Really, one of the fine finest Noruz events around. Saturday, March 16th, the Bidmesh Kanoru's Gala at the Universal Event Space in Greater Ontario, uh, Greater Ontario, Greater <laughs> Toronto. Uh, if you want to look up Bidmesh uh, and come join that Noru's Gala, Black Cats, the new Black Cats. Mm -hmm. mm. Excited to. Yeah. Who's and here five, stuff? five wow. guest singers. I have no idea. Whoa, but, special guests. And our very own Anahita will be dancing at this uh, big yes. as well. That's right. So there you go. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It's there that you can link to all of our platforms, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, CastBox. If you'd like to see, to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to YouTube. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and in Persian, check us out on Telegram. Uh, for tickets to our live show, go to our Instagram, go to our website as well. And our website is where you can become a Rook member, a patron uh, and at our Patreon page, which you link to from our main website. Just press the support us button at rookmedia.com. There's all the announcements. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Raha. Thank you, Pega. See you next week. And let's get to our feature guest today. Our feature guest is a Norwegian-Iranian creative artist who's one of Norway's leading dancers, choreographers, and performers. He was born and raised in Tehran. And Navid Rezvani's professional work transcends genres, blending various dance styles and expressions with text. His notable achievements include performances with the Norwegian Opera, tours with the National Traveling Theatre, solo showcases at the Oslo Concert Hall and National Theatre, and appearances on live national television as well as international performances in San Francisco, in Spain and in India and many other places. Navid's accolades extend to winning the TV competition Persia's Got Talent in 2022 
2021, and he came in second in the Norwegian version of that show, Norway's Got Talent, in 2012. He is a former winner of the Oslo City Artist Award and beyond his dance prowess, Navid is committed to social causes. He delivers inspirational lectures driven by a vision to break down political and social barriers, advocating for a more diverse and inclusive society. And as I said earlier, he's always been outspoken about Iran. Right now, joining me for the first time on Rook, Navid Rezvani joins me from Oslo today. Hello, sir. Hello, Gian. So nice to be here with you. I would like to start off, of course, by saying thank you so much for inviting me on your program and having me to all your staff and especially to all the wonderful listeners and followers of Rock Media all over the world. Salam wa durud bar hame shoma. You see, you see, that's the Navid Rezvani charm. You're turning it on already. We barely started. <laughs> I'm inspired by you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, you're not just charming. You're incredibly talented. I, I, I don't even know how to. There's no way to overstate what you are capable of. So it's a great pleasure to have you on, and it's a long time coming. Thank you for doing this. Honored. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Navi John, I want to get into your story. I want to get into your thoughts. I want to get into your talents. But... Um, unfortunately, I feel like I have to divert things as we start off. Um, you know, you're never shy about speaking about Iran. And this has been another difficult week over the last few days. You you posted on Instagram this week that there are um, questions around what a real Iranian is. And you said one of the things you believe a real, real Iranian is is one that does not support executions. Mm-hmm. Um we can't really do this interview without talking about that execution this week and and your feelings. Tell me about the reaction you had to yet another person being executed in Iran this week. You know that that is the core of uh, what hurts every bit of my cell in my body. That our people, our people, are taking lives of our people. You know, that is that is crazy. I mean, like we are our own enemy like that. We are we are our own cancer. And that is that is terrible. One thing is an enemy coming to take over or 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 go to war against you, but your own people doing that to you in our time. That is that is basically not human no more, you know, and uh, and where we are in civilization and Iran being the birthplace of civilization. Yes. Having that, that does not work. But the birthplace of human rights, some would argue. Absolutely. In, yeah. I mean, wherever, whatever fact we look back at, you know, it, it, it talks about that, that human rights with the Cyrus Cylinder and everything, uh, that, that's, what our, that's what our true history is all about, you know, and where are we today? So, uh, so it, it really hurts me. And living in Norway, uh, which every... Norwegian knows that one of the most important values as Norwegian is that human rights. You know, we had the well, the neo-Nazi terrorist Anders Breivik that uh, that set a bomb off in the Norwegian government building and killed eight people there and shot a lot of youth in the uh, youth workers uh, league party, a political party, uh, killing around up to all together 77, yeah. 77 people, you know, and, and today, that dude, he is in is in prison, yeah. and uh, and when that happened, the Norwegians didn't come out and say let's kill him. They lifted roses in solidarity with Norway, in 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 coming together, uniting for love and peace. That is that is where I get my values from, you know. And 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 to think about what is going on in Iran, where it was supposed to be the birthplace of human rights. That that is that is not that is not right. It was the birthplace of it was the birthplace of you. And and sometimes I think um, I don't know. I always think this is true, but that maybe there's a divide between those of us who were born and grew up in the diaspora outside of Iran, who might look at what's going on in Iran, even after decades of having family there and knowing of the of the atrocities, and still react with some shock, you know, um, uh, about an execution like this. But you're someone who was born into the Islamic Republic uh, after the 1979 revolution. You lived there for half of your life so far. Um, when you when you hear about an execution like the one this week, do you 
I mean, I'm guessing you don't react with shock. What are the emotions you go through? So this is where this is where the skeleton in the closet comes out. You see, this this there's a complicated thing about my past, and that is that my father um, uh, was a uh, was a diplomat representing the Islamic Republic, and that's where things gets very complicated for me. You see, but to give you an introduction really quick, he was a diplomat and working for the foreign affairs before the Iranian Revolution, and one of the very few that got to stay back in the foreign affairs after the revolution. Yes. Very few of them stayed back. So we're talking about a person that kind of was into that system before the revolution, graduated political science in America, uh, uh, Detroit, Michigan, and uh, and we, we traveled many different parts of the world with him. So I am a son of Iran, and, uh, and I have represented Iran both from the Islamic Republic side but also from the Iran that we have in our blood. And uh, and that's where things are very heavy for me because I had to live a life where I was, as a, as a youth, I was totally against myself, you know? And I could just give you guys one example. And that was when I was sitting in international schools, I was not allowed to sit by people that were eating non-halal meat, or I was not allowed to sit by an American from the American embassy or anybody from Israel there. I grew up with a lot of with a lot of pressure on me, you know, and uh, and we had to follow the Islamic Republic rules. So so whatever whatever I grew up with transformed transformed me because there was a side inside of me that wanted to be just like everybody else in different car- parts of the world that I lived in, mm. and there was a side of me that I had to respect and say yes to everything my dad said because of the work that he had. So I grew up with this double moral life. You know, and 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 everything that would happen to the Iranians that I had to in some way support still till today burns inside me. And uh, and I feel like I have a sort of responsibility on my shoulders because it was the Islamic Republic that sent my father to these uh, missions, which I ended up in Norway and I got to stay back in Norway for. So I I owe this to our people of Iran. So if I am having this life today as a dancer is because the system of Iran which was supposed to work for the people, right? Sent us out. So I, I feel like I, I went out as a representative of the people, but I never got to do my job at that time. But when I became free on my own, like today, I represent my people. And that is why I speak out about what I have seen and what I am seeing, for example, with the, with the execution that has happened, that I'm totally against it, that it hurts me, it is not a surprise because we've seen it happen yeah. very often, but still every time that it happens, it's a part of us being taken away from us. It's, it's interesting because I was going to ask you if winning Persia's Got Talent, which was such a, um, a high profile um, event in your life, it would be in anyone's life, particularly for the Iranian community, maybe not outside, outside of the global Iranian community, but the Iranian community would be aware of the winner of Persia's Got Talent if after that you felt responsibility now to speak out. But it sounds like your lineage and your life journey via your dad's job and all of that is where that responsibility, that feeling of responsibility comes from in you, huh? Yeah, that is totally correct. That is totally correct. You know, because my father, even though he was representing the Islamic Republic, he has, he still till today has those very strong values of being a patriot, an Iranian patriot, the true person that cares for the people of Iran. And and I would I have witnessed that. You know, when when Iranians would come to the embassy to get their passports fixed or things, my father would treat them with love and respect. Mm. And that is that that is where I got. To understand that no matter what system we live in, we as individuals have the opportunity to make that difference, to be that light that uh, that uh, uh, Martin Luther Jr., uh, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about. You know, to, to be to be to be that light, to be that love that could uh, that could make a difference. And I saw that through my dad. I got inspired by it, and I felt that responsibility uh, on my shoulder as well. That I, I love that word ambassador because it represented the people you know and mm. uh, unfortunately i didn't feel like our journey uh with those people that we work with often did represent all those values but but i i like to feel that on me that i'm an, an unofficial unofficial ambassador for the people Na- navid can i ask where your dad is now 
Yeah, he's in Tehran. Do you ever worry or have trepidation about speaking out, knowing that you're, you're high profile and, and your, your dad sort of is as well? Well, the thing is, you know, my father, uh, my father did his part uh, and served the people as good as he could. And he, what I do or what I represent in Norway has nothing whatsoever to do with him. He has no sort of control over me or any of that. And, uh, and what I share here with you uh, is something that the whole system very well knows because, because uh, he, he worked with them. So that is nothing that I'm, uh, that I, not, no secret here. But of course, as from the time that I've started speaking out publicly, I have lived with a, like I've signed a contract with myself that, you know, whatever could happen, yeah. uh, could happen. But I, I cannot hold my mouth shut, shut no more because because I cannot live that life anymore. Mm. You know, I owe it. I owe it to my to my family, and I owe it to our people. So just like everybody else that is standing out there today speaking out, I'm doing that as well. That's quite inspirational. There are a lot of people who are a lot less high profile than you who um, don't speak out or worry about that. I mean, you, you in that post that I referenced on Instagram from earlier this week, uh, you did. It is an interesting question that you ask in amidst saying that. Uh, um, you you believe in Iranians who don't support ex executions. This question of what an Iranian is, which uh, I don't want to get into too deep into the rabbit hole on this, but but you know it it is something that comes up um, even anecdotally sometimes in fun ways amongst those of us who work on this program. Somebody who's just come from Iran a couple of years ago versus someone like me who has grown up in the diaspora but whose parents are um, from Iran and still has family there. Um, between those worlds of inside Iran, outside Iran, uh, how do you handle that question of what an Iranian is? You know, Iranians who meet me in Oslo or in Norway, they take a moment and they either smile, they either show that they they recognize me by just a flip of an eye or something, or they just uh, come past by, stop and speak to me. And... Uh, and though I'm not in Iran right now, these people meeting me reminds me of reminds me of our Iran, and and every one of them, no matter how long they've lived in Norway, when I get to speak with them, the first sentence we speak, whether if it's in Farsi or Norwegian, we we are Iranians. There is nothing that can change that. There is nobody that could say anything that could change that because being an Iranian is so. It's so vibrant. Mm. It's so it's so it's so powerful, and uh, and it's full of love. Not this superficial love that we talk about on uh, social media, but there is the moment that they spend talking to you. That that is when you really feel that. And unfortunately, people who speak about what a true Iranian is are the ones that are politically and negatively motivated in order to disturb what movement we are trying to make in order to bring that freedom. So I, 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 I always know when that, when that question comes up, it's negatively motivated and it's only hmm. in aim of uh, disturbing uh, the, the process that we're having. So I don't put so much focus into that, but I do uh, confront it. I do confront it just because I like to get, I like to provoke back, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't kind of mess with me that much. But, you know, when you say, uh, and you've said before, no matter how many years you've lived in Oslo and, and, and outside of Iran, that Iran is in your blood, it's in your DNA. Uh, it's a beautiful sen sentiment and one that I, I relate to, uh, having not grown up in Iran. Um, mm -hmm. But what, what does it mean in practical terms? I mean, if you, could, if you were to give an example of what you feel like that actually means... Um, All right. Because yeah, uh, because unfortunately, and I and I and I think uh, partly as as a as a form of responsibility that we're taking with a program like this too, we often focus on some of the negative stuff too, right? We go well, well, you know, being Iranian means we lie to each other, or we're you know we we have trouble unifying, or we or 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 this or that. Um, what what does it mean in 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 the most positive sense? If you can think of a practical application of what it means to for Iran to be in your blood. You know, when when uh, when I was privileged enough to win Persia's Got Talent, um, 
there were there were many Norwegians who followed me and followed my journey on Persia's Got Talent because, of course, I have a strong relation to the culture scene here in Norway. So some of the big heads or the heavyweights of uh, culture in Norway were following me. One of them wrote a comment on one of my posts on Facebook after listening to what the judges on um, Persia's Got Talent had to say to me on feedback. And this dude wrote to me that it's funny because in Norway and other parts of the world, when you hear judges speak, they're like, oh, you were incredible. Oh, wow, this, your dreams, this, that. But when we hear these Iranians speak, they speak with poetry. Hmm. They, they they recite poetry on, on their feedbacks. They speak about Rumi, they speak about Hafez and Sadi, and they, they bring out like all these things. It's There's so much culture, there's so much depth in what you guys, it's so deep. It, it, hmm. that, that reminded me, that is where I come from. That is, that is truly heritage of thousands of years, man. That is what we are. We, we come from that. That is why we speak like that, because we have layers of layers of history and culture and color and arts in our bodies. So, so a true Iranian for me is, is a person, is a person that recognizes what we come from and the responsibility to preserve and take care of mm. that culture in every way possible. That was a great answer, man. That's a really great answer. Thank you. <laughs> you know, you're, you talk about poetry, it is poetry what you are able to do with your body. Um, it's also just remarkable um, dance skill. And I, uh, I have to say, I mean, I, I, I know a lot of Iranian dancers and, and we've had a few on the show who are very talented. And even the ones who aren't um, world class like you, I, I am so... Uh, enamored of and so respectful towards because they are they have honed a craft that you're not even allowed to practice in in the country of our heritage especially those who've grown up in Iran uh, or the or the the kids I see young women doing hip hop dancing um, with something covering their face you know from somewhere in in Tabriz or something I just think wow you know and so for you to have become what you have become. Um, having lived the, your first many years in, in Iran, it is quite remarkable. And I love the story that you, your dad is this diplomat, and because of that, you guys travel a bit when you're a kid. And so you're five years old, and you're in Malaysia, and the TV is on. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, right? And and you see, and you see what 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 changes your life with what you see on TV in Malaysia. I mean, I'm telling you, bro, there were there were there were superheroes that I grew up with in Southeast Asia. I, I wanted to be just like every one of them. And and that is because, you know, we left Iran and and you know, Iran is we're used to having dad, mom, dad, uncles, aunts, cousins, and everybody at home. And suddenly I'm in a part of the world where I don't know anybody, you know, and I'm and I feel like I wanna be seen, be heard, be hugged, be laugh and have a good time and so i look for superheroes as as people to inspire me to do things that could give me attention and you know i get to see this guy bruce lee on tv i get to see this dude this dude with these with these incredible shoulders and making all these sounds and these abs of his with like cut abs and everything and he's so incredible Doing all these martial arts stuff that I had also seen in Iran as well, and uh, and that's where everything started, man. That's where the whole physicality in me, like there was this, there was this, there was, you know, when they say I saw the light, that's that's kind of what happened to me, man. Bruce Lee, and then comes Spider Man and Michael Jackson, and each one of these people played such an important part in physicality in bringing in opening my mind to a world of language body language and and the more i was banned from doing it the more i fell in love with it the more the more i was not allowed to write michael jackson on the walls the more i fell in love with writing it you know and and uh, and and all of that since i couldn't do it during the period of my dad's work it, they all stayed inside like you know they were they were kept like very very close to me so when i became 17 18 in norway and life was in my hand 
that's the first thing I did. My dad left Norway. I jumped out of university studying geology. I jumped out. I went straight to dance. I gave it my 100%. Well, hang on a second. I want to, let me get to that. Let me get to that though. Just two steps back. First of all, I just love it. I love I love Bruce Lee and Spider Man. When you're in Malaysia, you're enamored of these two superheroes, and then you go to Philippines for a while, and that's where you really discover Michael Jackson because you know they're so into. I love Philippines, by the way. It's one of my favorite places in the world, and they're so into singing and dancing and karaoke. And I could just see that Michael Jackson would have been massive. And and what I love about that those that that trio that troika Bruce Lee Spider Man Michael Jackson. If you don't mind me saying so, watching you dance, which mm. is kind of, in a way, I mean, I'm not a dance expert, but like I say, I've been around a fair bit of dance in my life and seen, you know, I, I mean, I guess it could be classified maybe as hip hop or modern or what, but but it's really hard to classify exactly what you do. And if I were to try, I would say it's like a combination of Michael Jackson with Bruce Lee and, <laughs> and Spider-Man. Like those influences are in you still watching what you do on stage. Definitely, definitely. And, uh, and, and, and as you mentioned very intelligently right there, they are actually very important uh, sources of inspiration to hip hop as well when hip hop was born. They played a very important role in the birth uh, and the journey of hip hop, you know, these three characters. And yeah, uh, even till today, I it doesn't go a time where I don't see a kid walking the street having a Spider-Man hat or a beanie or <laughs> backpack with Spider-Man picture on the where I stop and I smile. There doesn't come a moment where I where I don't see Michael Jackson doing that backslide or doing those spins and grabbing his crutch and going, Yee! and that I don't that I don't take that it doesn't take me back to my childhood. Or were, were you an athlete? So because uh, because of the past in Iran and Taekwondo being so popular in Iran, I, I started taking some classes before we went to Malaysia. So that was kind of like a little start there, but it was nothing serious at all. Uh, it was just like a little introduction. But, uh, but then once I got into Southeast Asia, then taking Taekwondo classes became serious and, and kicking everywhere, everything building pillows at home with mom and dad weren't home and kicking them. Yeah, I'm telling you, those were those were the good days for me. <laughs> so uh, I'm really curious about how this happens. Like, uh, first of all, I mean, you're obviously you must have some you, at an early age, even when, as you tell stories about, you know, your parents coming home and when you're in Philippines and you're hanging from the ceiling like Spider-Man and, you know, you clearly had this athletic ability in you. But I'm curious about those years growing up in Iran um 80s 90s islamic republic you know to a certain extent iranian dancer is an oxymoron right because you you're you're talking about something that is not even allowed to be considered uh in inside the country um i'm wondering what your what you were doing in those years um that to prepare yourself to become one of the greatest dancers we have in the world right now i mean do you were were you in a basement somewhere doing this and 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 while you were doing it were you actually thinking this could ever be a career or were you just doing it in defiance of of just doing something you're passionate about you know it was um, i was doing it because it it was it was a voice inside me you know and uh, and it was it was always calling me it was always calling me i didn't understand what it was but it was always calling me whether it was watching Khorda Dion dance on those music videos. And when when I would go to uh, weddings, Arusi, and I would see everybody dance, I would just get out all the moves that I could just in hope of, of one day maybe this could lead to something, even though I never could in a million years imagine that, you know? Mm. So every opportunity that I found to dance, I would dance. And one of the first times I actually danced public stuff that I would learn on from music videos uh, from NTV or people that would bring videos uh, to Iran, friends or family relatives. One of the first times that I actually got to dance in public where I really felt like, oh my gosh, if I could do this for a living. That was when Iran played their national, uh, they were the national Iranian team was playing against Australia. Mm. And Khodad and, Azizi and hit that goal and it was like, it was they were behind and then suddenly everything changed the last minute people ran out in the streets and i was in tehran we 
we all ran out in the streets. And you know what happened? Those ciphers where we call in hip hop, the big circles where people get to dance and mm. then everybody screams. They opened these circles and I went in there and I danced and, and I could do some some sort of moves, like like really like amateur kind of stuff, but mm. it was what I learned from the, and people were screaming for me and they would pull me in the circles. And I, and I felt like, oh, gosh, this is what I want to do. So, so that was probably the first time I felt like in Iran I mean, and you know, it's never allowed unless something so crazy like that right, happens. Right, right, right. All bets are off. Street. Everybody's out on the street. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. And, and everybody's standing on the corners. Here comes police. Run this, this, that. But once you had that opportunity to get into it and you just did it, it was so powerful for everybody. Women, elders, young children, boys, girls. So that is kind of where where I got a shot of that feeling of that sense. Before that, I mean, you're you're a young guy, but you're old enough to have lived before the internet, and so so this this is a dumb this, is, this question sounds dumb to somebody who's twenty years old today. When if I were to say, you know, how are you exposed to hip hop dancing in Iran? You know, they they can see it on on Instagram or something like that. But but before the twenty first century, you know, back to the nineties. Um, mm -hmm. This is hard stuff for you to access to even just see what what videos were you looking at? Where were you learning how to break? So, so there we go. Now, in Iran, there were these underground scenes like everything else that we had, but it was done to techno music and the dance was called what was just called techno. These are these are dances that we we would get to see on music videos that were brought in by VHS by friends or whatever to Iran or at that time we had those Mahvare satellites mm. uh, private satellites where we would put behind the curtain so nobody could see it and we would get to see some of those Turkish channels and see some of those moves right but the music video from Run DMC it's like that and that's the way it is that was probably one of the most influential music videos that came to Iran and just brought a revolution to the youth. And everybody had that video, flipping it to everyone in classrooms and all. We would go home, watch that, and we'll come to school in in different rooms where no teachers were, and we'll train and train and train in hope of that Thursday night, Panshan Beshap, to go to those parties and just show all the moves that we learned. But this became this became a movement and battles. We got to see battles in these VHS videos, and we started battling each other battling each other and we called it Kal, 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 Kardan. Yeah, you, you would go up to this other group from that part of Shahrak Qarb in Tehran and you would bring your crew that you made uh, randomly and you would just do all these moves that you've seen. And this became a, a movement and it became bigger and bigger and we would start doing it in parks, in Park Emelat, Park Kurba, wow. and Shahrak Qarb. And, and, and of course, once it got as big as like uh, like really big, the attention got out. Then police would come and and yep, they would arrest us and they would take us in and we would have to promise we would never do this again or get like slapped in the face, kicked in the butt, and all that. But this movement kept on growing and then uh, and then it was pop. The most popular places to do it was to to show off in front of girls at the parties, at the underground home parties, either birthday parties or when guys and girls would get together and throw these underground parties. We would go there and show these moves. I'm assuming you were arrested at some point or another for doing this. There was one time I got I got arrested and uh, at Khiabun Vanak. There was that was in Tehran. We were jamming in a little grass area doing back backflips. I'm telling you, we were doing backflips. But just because we were a group of people dressed like hip hop looking, and there were some girls yeah. sitting down there, they just raided the place, put us in the car, and they just took us away. And that was. One of my very sad stories that I had to confront mom and dad with after they found out that I was arrested. There's these little yeah. things that, again, I mean, never a surprise coming out of Iran, but, but um, in terms of the, with this regime, but there's little things that happen that that really hurt. I, do you remember a few years ago when that um, that the, there were four kids who were, I mean, I, I don't know if they were maybe in their twenties, who were dancing to "Happy," the song by Pharrell. Because I'm happy, you know that song, and and they all got yeah. arrested, uh, mm -hmm. and and detained, and it was it, that that really hurt me because it was mm -hmm. just such a they weren't even great dancers. I don't know if they were dancers. They were just kind of joyously expressing themselves to that song, which is called happy, and only to be detained for that. You know, it was such a it was such a moment. 
Yeah, and that that went viral all over the world, and dancers would hit me up on Instagram, on my social media, and they're like, did you see that? Is that true? Are you for real for dancing? Yeah. I'm like, man, I could tell you stories about that stuff. Yeah. But yep, that truly sat on me as well and hurt me. Uh, Nabi, when did you know you were really good? Or, or when did other people know? I mean, what, was it in those teenage years or even before that? You know, uh, Jandran, you gave me this very nice compliment where you said your talent. And uh, to be very honest with you, I know that it comes from the good, but I, I truly don't believe in that word talent because I, it might sound like crazy, but I, but I really never had that. I, everything that I learned, I had to work so hard for. I had to work so much harder than all my friends to learn the same move that everybody would learn, like a lot faster than I did. It just like, for some reason, mm. it felt like I was not born to, 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 to do this. But I wouldn't stop training. I mean, I was obsessed with learning it, mm. and that's kind of what helped me get better and better. But through long time, where people had given up on me a long time before I got good, you know, but. I've heard you say this, that uh, I don't believe in talent, I only believe in heart. And it sounds like one of those nice things that people say, a bit taro fee, like, you know. Um, I mean, because really, really anyone can be you if they just work hard enough? This is where the difference is. Anyone who truly loves what they want to do mm. can be anything they want to be. Now, you can never compare nobody to me as I cannot be compared to anybody else. And that is what people don't get. We are all born so unique and we have something unique about us that nobody else has. Why should anybody want to be as good as me or I as good as anybody else when I could be as best product of what I can be. And that is why I do not believe in talent, because if talent is a is something to measure how good you are compared to somebody else, then the whole fundamental of this thing is wrong, because I can never be compared to anybody else, because there is something else inside me that, that leads me, that drives me to this. I do not know anybody else in Norway that is driven by the energy and what it is that I'm driven by, and that is my Iran. Mm. You know, so how can you... So, so a lot of people, when they get tired, they go home. I stand there because I know anybody in Iran, any of those dancers in Iran, in Iran would give anything in their life to have my spot. Mm. So why would I just walk out of something that I, that I know is so much more powerful and beautiful? And that is what a lot of people, that motivation they don't have. So they don't maybe reach these things. But in order to get to where I am, I have sacrificed a lot sacrifice so i've had many surgeries shoulders been blasted I'm, i mean surgeon went inside my shoulder and said like oh my gosh it looks like a truck hit mm. you or something you know so so it's all these are things that a lot of people like suddenly like halfway through i like, give up and walk away i never did i'm 40 years old and i'm still fighting for that dream i'm still 100 percent in this and uh and that is what defines uh that word that you mentioned good in what you do it's that consistency in believing that there is something that you want to achieve in order to make you happy from the inside i mean frankly good's an understatement but uh, but i you're 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 exceptional but i but i'll um, huh? i'll put that aside that's a, that's a little too eager need to spend half the interview telling you how good you are um, <laughs> so, so so but i but i i'm guessing your parents didn't want you to become a dancer, at least in your teens, right? Nope. My parents, my parents, my dad was thinking, okay, Iran got oil, Norway got oil. My son is Iranian. My son has Iranian roots. Norway is a beautiful country, very privileged country for him to work and live in. Why not push him to do something where he could live a happy life, in his opinion, earn a lot of money, and be able to also have the connection to his roots. So no way in hell that any of them wanted me to dance or become a dancer. But that did not go their way because I lived in a country that taught me in Norway that life is in your hands. You are an independent individual and have every right to become everything that you want to be and nobody can tell you otherwise. So I, uh, so I went the complete opposite direction of what was expected by me, by my family and their family and everybody that they know. Who and was that hard? 
it was terrible, man. They put a lot of pressure on them and that pressure would translate on the phone to me and that was not fun. That was just to have your mom and dad not happy with you because of what you're doing long away from them. That itself is enough yeah. pain to carry every day as an Iranian. And I carried that on me for many, many years till I did this TV show, So You Think You Can Dance in Norway, and uh, I made it to one of the finalists and the video went out where the judge said something very strong to me with tears in her eyes. And my dad saw that video and uh, and when he spoke to me, I heard that 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 bogs we say that it cracked in him and tears were coming out as he was speaking. And that's when I that's when I knew that I got my dad finally on my side. And ever since then, he's been one of my biggest fans. Oh and been supporting me, shares my videos on his social wow. media. Wow. And, right. and here's where it gets even funny. And he thinks he's sometimes my manager because he <laughs> keeps on giving me advice on how I should be in dance and how of to course, have my Of course, of course he does. <laughs> so so that, is, that, is, that is also, again, that consistency in believing and, and they got to believe in it as well. What, what kind of dance advice does your dad, the diplomat in Iran, give you? <clears throat> well, I mean, first of all, he loves the fact that it has an, an athletic approach right. because he says that it reminds him of the Pahlevan, uh, <laughs> that, that great right. like hero, heroic uh, feeling of an Iranian. And he likes all the heavy physicality in it. So he tells me like, you know, uh, one thing is really nice, the dancing that you do and the this and that, but all those heavy tricks that you throw in there, those are really cool. So he kind of... He kind of pushes me, and I think it it is a little bit motivated from that Iranian thing that they still don't know if the dance itself is so accepted. But once it becomes really athletic, then they're like, okay, okay, look more like a sport, you know what I mean? But anyways, I'm so super grateful that I have their support and that they're uh, that they're following me and they're uh, showing me love after not getting it for so many years. It's uh, I, I'm sorry that it's a shame when it takes all of that. Um, you know, uh, but um, um, understandable coming out of the culture of Iran, where um, sadly we've discussed it many times on this program, um, arts and culture are not elevated to um, be considered careers and and jobs, and so um, parents tend to to shift kids away from that. And and it's no small feat for you to have become a dancer and become as great as you are, but but also to, to navigate having to do something that your parents are not happy with. So many great talents end up going and becoming an engineer because that's what they're supposed to do. So um, it does take a lot of fortitude. You you said something, I was watching your, um, uh, I watched, <laughs> I end up watching the strange things you do preparing for interviews like this. Uh, <laughs> I never thought I would have a, a cause to watch back episodes of Norway's Got Talent, but, but uh, there I was watching Norway's Got Talent last night, um, various episodes from, from 10 years ago, mind you, from 2012. And on your way to one of the finals, you, there's a quote, you quote Eminem, um, and you say, uh, imagine if you had one chance in life, would you take it or would you let it slip away? And I wonder what that, that means to you. I wonder if that's a mantra that you live with day to day and 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 if you can sort of um explain that to us yeah it, it does i gotta admit it does get emotional to uh, to just think about that because it rem it takes me back to those iranians every time i went back to tehran to train with the iranian underground dancers which i would always have to say that i'm doing sports with them in order to allow us to have those training sessions in those rooms that they would rent called professional aerobics. But anyways, I would go in those rooms and I would train with these guys. And, you know, they would tell me, you're so lucky. They would watch my videos competing around the world. They would tell me, you're so lucky to have this life. And I would feel ashamed of myself for having this privilege of living in Norway, for being able to do all that I do with my dance, because I knew there were so many incredible motivated people in Iran. I'm telling you, some of them are so good in what they do that they're so underrated by the world because people don't search them up, don't understand. There are so many out there that would blow people's minds away because 
they live in this pressure and they translate it into physicality and it's incredible anyways so when i hear them say you're so lucky and i see it in their eyes with tears and i and i feel that shame inside me that is that opportunity that one chance that i'm talking about that if they would have that one chance that they would do everything that they can with it so that is why i sit back every opportunity coming to me i remind myself this is my brother that dude in iran this is my sister that girl in iran that that would take this opportunity and will blow the world up with their uniqueness and that's what i do each time i get a chance to go perform i tell myself you're doing something that a lot of people will give their lives to have this opportunity you really do say that to yourself each oh, time sir oh yes i i say it i say it even sometimes when i go to practice when i'm having a bad day i tell myself that in order to transform that negative energy that is in me that's telling me oh you could rest it off today i'm like heck no this is my one shot take it or let it slip away and i'm taking that baby <laughs> And and I mean, that sort of answers my, I was, because the other mantra that you live by or you, you talk about, it's dancing is my freedom. Yes. And I mean, it's, it's self-explanatory, but I, when you're at the level that you are and you're, you know, you're, it's a career and you're with the opera and the national theater and all of these things that you're doing. Um, I, I wonder if, if it still has that spirit of defiance, you know, where you're, you, you're doing something that is, um, related to freedom for you, but I guess you just kind of answered that. If, if, if in fact you tell yourself every single time that this is something that you're, you know, the people of, of our heritage are not allowed to do or can't do in many cases, that it really still is your freedom each time. It definitely is. You know, during the time where I where, where I was too scared or too afraid to speak out about the injustice, the suppression that our people experience, I had the dance to speak for me. I did not need to use any words. I got to say everything I wanted using my body. And many times, because of the music I would use, because of the, the way I would dance, a lot of people would get a sense of what I'm trying to tell them. And that was itself a sense of, freedom because this had to come out because I felt truly chained not being able to stand up and scream that I want freedom for my people and that's why every time I would dance always with a message never just to go there just do a headspin mm. always carrying a message it felt like oh I released or I took off weight off my shoulders so yes even till today it takes me back to that because that's where my my fundamentals comes from my dance came from from feeling that pressure of not being allowed to do what I wanted to. And and so every time I dance, I feel free. That's why I dance without a shirt on a lot of times. I take my shirt off. I thought it was just to show off your hot body. Well, that is one side of it, of course. But <laughs> but 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 it, it but it's uh, it's mostly because it's mostly because I know that that freedom to take your shirt off and dance as a man is so like a man shouldn't do this and this and this and that and it gives me that freedom because one day I dream to be in the streets of Iran on a platform without my shirt on and just dancing both with Iranian pop movements that reminds me of Horda Dian mm. movements would take me back to Iranian core that tradition movements from the modern hip hop of the world today standing on a stage in the streets of Iran and dancing that is the dream that I am going to continue dancing till that one day that happens and I could feel that ultimate freedom. Then I could say, you know what? Mission accomplished. <laughs> if you if you used to just speak through your dance, you now speak through your words. You've been quite outspoken about Iran, especially um, after the uprising a year and a half ago after the killing of Masa Amini. Uh, what was the moment for you, Navid, where you, where you snapped and said, no, I got I to gotta start speaking out? When the girl, when I saw this girl in the street, said to the police officer, shoot me. She said, shoot me, I'm not moving. Oh my gosh, I said, what, what the heck did I just see? How come I never had the courage to stand up and do 5% of that? How come a person like me living in all this freedom didn't dare? And a girl in Iran in that situation would say, shoot me. And there, I just said, you know what, it, I'm, I'm done. It's enough. I can't take this. I can't face the world 
con constantly hiding in my shell. I need to speak out. And this is the time to do it. There is no better moment than to, to walk out on the woman life freedom movement and say, you know what, you support such a powerful cause and you believe in it. And now from here on, you're going to stand with the women and the men of Iran and keep fighting. I am not at all into fighting with violence. I completely am against that. I do not even say mad bad or death to anybody anybody no matter what they have done i do not believe in that so for me i i i fight with my dance and a lot of people say how 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 do you how would you ever do such a thing you can't do that just if you get to inspire one iranian inspire to hope which suppression is trying to kill that hope mm -hmm. if you could give them that hope that they could wake up knowing that there is a light that they could look forward to, that they could continue doing it, even if everybody tells them not to. You are fighting a system of suppression, and there is no chance in hell that anybody can stop me from doing that or tell me that I'm not fighting with my dance, because I know that to inspire is the greatest form of fighting suppression. Well, let me ask you about hope then, because um, there was there was a lot of hope. There was a lot of... Um, I mean, there is exuberance uh, along with unity in the months that followed. I mean, there was a great deal of um, um, horror and, and, and um, tragedy happening in terms of kids being shot and, and the suppression of the regime during the uprising. But, but there was a lot of hope for the global Iranian diaspora in the, in the weeks and months after the killing of Massa. I mean, you know this, uh, the uprising kind of peaked and then and then uh people were in prison people were executed people were suppressed it's not where it was right now where it was a year ago or a year and a half ago are you uh hopeful for the future of iran you know it's funny because if you I have many times spoken to many psychologists because what we do is so extreme that you need to be able to speak to somebody so that you know that you're not going insane, uh, lost into a crazy world of of art where a lot of people could lose themselves, you know? And, and I speak because I, I love getting information and knowledge to get support mentally as well. Now, once you are into something for so long, and it messes with your system, you get traumatized by it for too long. If it doesn't, if it takes you out of what the society does and all that, you, you kind of get so deep into it. Now, the one thing that psychologist tells you, it, this is not, this is not an, an express train to fix. You need to go on and on and on as same way You've got where you are and it has messed with your system. You need to go that way again to unlock, take these bricks out, put them back. And it takes time. It takes time. That's what a lot of, unfortunately, us Iranians are not understanding that this has been 40 something years. You cannot undo something overnight. Even if it does happen overnight, it will not last unless it's fundamentally shaped with the bricks going to the right places from the core strong with foundation so that it could stand and not fall the week after. So yes, I do have hope because what is happening now is that these right bricks are falling in place, in my opinion, and we need to give it time and not think that it's going to be an express train. It is very difficult to think that because a lot of our people are losing their lives, but we have to look at the bigger picture in leading it towards a positive and safe as much as we can for the security of our people, but allow allow this movement to continue doing its thing. And we, from the outside, have such a big responsibility on our shoulders in order for this hope not to die out because the ones in Iran are looking at us. Mm. They are looking at us, even though they say, you might not be a real Iranian, but trust me, we know all of us that they are looking outside. So we need to have that hope and continue pushing and building these structures in order for them to be inspired and to also keep pushing what they're doing. That's um, so profoundly said. I like to think about uh, doing critical interviews where I'm uh, challenging you rather than just agreeing with everything you said. But that it's so it's so well said. Thank you for saying that, uh, and that you're you're not wrong. I mean, if, if there's if your mantra is dancing is my freedom, something that I live by is 
Um, mm. Nothing of worth comes quickly. You know, it, it always, it always inevitably takes time, even when you don't want it to. Um, and speaking of time, uh, before I let you go, um, I'm curious, just thinking about you and thinking about how remarkable your journey is and has been. And you mentioned earlier in the in the interview, you're you're turning forty or you're forty years old. Uh, so that's I'm not outing you on that. Um, yeah. how, how do you how do you feel about aging? I mean, what you do, um, I would think, has a best before date. You can't do this for forever at the level that you have been. How, what's your relationship with that? You see, we're living in a time right now that people are getting so much more informed about physicality, about about our bodies, about nutrition, about what we eat and not eat, and what we what we consume and how we live, and the more correct knowledge i'm not talking about those instagram posts that float all over the place to get to get you just to click on them right but the ones that who truly understand based on experience are athletes are elder people that have lived a very certain life of 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 taking care of themselves they are living a life today which is which is redefining what we knew as standards what, what old is 60 70 people are not old no more they are they are healthy they are strong and now this is where the very main core thing comes out mobility physic physical mobility of using and understanding how your joints work and using the best potential of it that is something we do not do because we tend to sit down so long on the couch oh, i'm getting old but i'm telling you training mobility allowing your joints to move in every direction possible you will be 70 years old and still keep doing things that people in their youth could not do because the body is such a complicated thing capable of shaping and reshaping itself each time the biomechanics that's of- that's wonderfully said I, and i i appreciate it and you're absolutely um i i hope you can all ed- educate all of us on that regularly but but even Lionel messi is not going to be able to keep playing um, at the top, at a top level, when he's in his fifties or sixties, right? So, uh, but I mean, that is the beauty of arts. You see, it's like fine wine. The older you get, the more mature it gets, and the more mature you get, the more you touch people's hearts, and you do not need to impress them so much. It's about the arts is very different from pure sports because the arts has a tendency to speak from heart to heart, and that is what we tre- we tend to become more reflected on and to become more to grow more on is mm. how to communicate with feelings and emotions some things that artificial intelligence is going to have a lot of problems to deal with while we as artists who use our bodies to express have understood that how we express something it doesn't have to be difficult but it has to be sometimes simple is the best way of doing it but still being able to move that itself to move and to express that is what I'm aiming for. So I do not need to do 500 backflips in order to get somebody's attention to tell my story. I just need to be able to be honest to the moment and still be able to use my body to just move. Sounds like the answer to um, what is your relationship with aging is is a positive one. It's your uh, and and wisdom only comes with living longer. Nothing nothing of worth comes quickly, young Jedi. Thank you, sir. Appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's been a it's been a real. Um, joy to get to to know you and uh and to to do this interview and and um if uh, if you've been living your dream as you've said a few times as well um whether it's winning persia's got talent or ascending to to the places that you have doing the thing you love is there a particular dream is there a particular place that navid resvani wants to to get to in say the next five years that that we can watch you get to? I would love to have the opportunity to explore the world of acting as well. Because I think that the spotlight of uh, being a dancer has allowed me to express a lot with my body, which I will never stop doing. But I would love to be able to use, to use, to fall into some other people's characters as well. And I would really love to connect to Iranian directors or producers who would maybe be able to see some sort of potential that they could believe that I could nurture in me to be able to also uh, 
tell these stories, which I'm seeing so beautifully by Iranian directors and producers coming out these movies that are so powerful, impacting so many parts of the world, telling stories about Iran. So if I get that opportunity to connect to these kind of people and that they could help me uh, and give me a platform, I would that would be that would be a beautiful dream which I am I have within me being processed right now and I'm trying to touch the right places to see if I could get to and the other one of course is that one day dancing in the streets of Iran publicly and that 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 is that is something that I'm dreaming of daily. I can I can see you being a superstar actor I'm so grateful for this opportunity and you're Khosh Tip you're you're the man bro I I they want that in mom. acting, right? For my mama. <laughs> but uh, but I would love to, at the very end here, say thank you to you to uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, because I know that you have such an important platform followed by so many people that are change makers, Iranians, international change makers, and I and I want to be connected to those heavyweights and maybe this could open those doors to me, but also a chance to get to know more Iranians. So I'm very thankful for that and that you guys have reached out. And I wish you guys all the best. Please continue doing what you're doing because we're all together a part of this movement with the freedom coming to our people. Navid, you're, you're, that's, you're very kind to say all of that. And it truly has been a, a great pleasure to talk to you. I hope we do it again and I hope we do it in person. Sure. I look forward yes, to sir. seeing you. I look forward to that Merci. as well. Thank you. Have a good night. Khodaf. Peace. David Rezvani. What a fabulous guy. Joining us from Oslo, Norway. This is full time for Rook for today. For all things Rook related, visit our website, rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. Super Patty Sauce, Smart Pega, Savvy Roham, Talented Anahita. Resident Raha, Methodical Kaban, Bearded Omid. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Do subscribe if you haven't done so already. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Find us as a show on Instagram at Rook Media. And as ever, in the meantime, Mizu and Bashim. <laughs>